Hello and welcome to our webinar on getting started on your Dexcom G5 Continuous Glucose Monitor. My name is Michelle. I'm a certified diabetes educator here at Dexcom. And today I'm going to be reviewing some very important training and education pertaining to your new Dexcom system that will really help ensure your success with it and help ensure that things go smoothly for you in the beginning. So your Dexcom should provide you with a lot of value in managing your diabetes. You will see real-time continuous glucose readings that will update every five minutes. In addition, you will also be able to view trend arrow information, telling you the speed and direction of your glucose. And this should help you take a more proactive approach when managing your diabetes. And because your Dexcom is measuring your glucose continuously, you and your physician will have a lot of extensive and thorough glucose information to look back on. And this will help you identify your individual trends and patterns, meaning where is your glucose typically high and where is your glucose typically low. This will really help guide you and your physician in determining what times of day are particularly problematic for you and need special attention or adjustments in your treatment regimen. Now before you get started, it's important for you to be aware of the level of accuracy you should expect to experience when using your Dexcom system. Meaning how close should your glucometer value be to your Dexcom glucose value? Sometimes they will be the exact same number, but more often than not, they will be close or similar. So if you check a finger stick value and you get a value that is 80 or less, your Dexcom should read within 20 points. But if you check a finger stick value and you get a value that's over 80, your Dexcom should read within 20%. So again, if you check a finger stick and you get a value that is 80 or less, your Dexcom should read within 20 points. But if you check a finger stick value and it's over 80, your Dexcom should read within 20%. So for example, if you check a finger stick and you get a value of 90, 20% 20 of 90 would be 18, and then you should expect to see a Dexcom value within 18 points of that 90. Or let's say you check a finger stick value and you get 70, then you should simply see a Dexcom reading within 20 points of that 70. Now your Dexcom consists of three different components. Figure one labeled here is your sensor or your sensor pod. It looks like a sticky band-aid piece with a very thin flexible sensor wire just below it. And that sensor wire is inserted into the subcutaneous or the fatty layer of your skin and it continuously measures your glucose. On top of that sensor pod is your transmitter labeled here in figure two. Your transmitter is a small gray rectangular piece that fits pretty snugly into the sensor pod on your skin and it wirelessly transmits the glucose information over to your display device labeled here in figure three. So your display device can either be the Dexcom receiver that came with your system or it can be a compatible smart device of your choice. And we have a list of compatible smart devices on our website at dexcom.com forward slash compatibility. So you may want to start to think about what kind of display device you want to use when you're using your Dexcom system. So you can either use just your Dexcom receiver or you can just use a smart device or you can use a combination of the two at the exact same time. You can also interchange between the two. So for example, you could use your smart device during the day and your receiver at night or vice versa. But whatever display device you decide to use, it is going to obtain the glucose information from the transmitter the same exact way, and that is through the use of Bluetooth technology. So both your transmitter and your display device will communicate with one another via Bluetooth so long that they remain within 20 feet of each other. So now I'm going to review some information pertaining to your receiver, including how to set it up. Later in the webinar, I will discuss how to set up the smart device. But even if you're not planning on using the receiver, I still encourage you to become somewhat familiar with it and to set it up in case you did ever need to use it in the future. Now the receiver does need to be charged periodically, and you can charge it in a wall outlet using the USB charging cable and AC power adapter that came with it. It can take up to five hours to fully charge the receiver, but a full charge will typically last you on average about three days. On the left hand side of your receiver, you have your screen, which displays your graph, your current glucose and your menu. On the right hand side, you have these navigational arrow buttons that allow you to navigate through the various menu options. 
In the middle there, you have a center select button. That's what you press when you want to make a selection in any of the menu options. It's also what you press when you want to clear or silence an alarm. Now to turn your receiver on for the very first time, you will press and hold down on the center select button until you feel that receiver vibrate. That will launch the setup wizard, which will walk you through how to set up your receiver for the first time. It will initially prompt you to set the date and the time. The date will be displayed as the year, the month, and then the day. It will then ask you to enter your transmitter serial number, otherwise known as your transmitter ID. So each and every transmitter is assigned a unique ID number that you can either find on the very back of the transmitter or on the white sticker on the box that your transmitter came in. It's a series of six letters and numbers that should start with the number four, and you want to manually enter that ID number into your receiver so that way your receiver knows specifically which transmitter it needs to communicate with. It will then ask you to set your low and your high glucose alert, or the level at which you would like it to alert you for a high or a low sugar. Now these alerts are modifiable, but your low alert will default to 80. You can leave it there or you can modify it. But one thing to consider when you are setting your low alert is you probably do want to set it just slightly higher than what you consider a hypoglycemic episode to be. So for example, if you consider a hypoglycemic episode to be 70 or less, you might want to consider setting your low alert to about 80, so that way the Dexcom really does what it's intended to do, which is to alert you before that hypoglycemic episode occurs, or at the very least at the very beginning of that hypoglycemic episode. Now your high alert will default to 200. You can leave it there or you can modify it. Some people do choose to set their high alert at the upper limit of their target glucose range at let's say 180 or 200. However, others feel that that would be alerting them way too often and so they choose to set their high alert at a level at which they would consider taking some sort of action. For example, a level at which they might consider checking the urine for ketones or taking a correction dose of insulin. Now you should also get guidance from your physician in determining where to set your high and low alert, but just remember that they are modifiable and you can customize them to meet your individual needs and your preferences. Now once you've set your low and your high alert on your receiver, you will need to set your alert profile or the sound you want your receiver to make when you get an alert. The first alert you have to choose from is vibrate. This means that your receiver would vibrate every five minutes until you press that center select button to clear the alarm. The one exception to that is if your sugar did hit 55 or less, the first alert would be a vibration, but if you did not clear it by pressing the select button, it would result in an audible alert five minutes later. The next option you can pick from is soft, and this is the quietest tone. The next one is normal, that's a little bit louder. The next one is attentive, which is the loudest, and the last one you can choose is hyporepeat. This has a similar tone to normal. The only difference is if your glucose hits 55 or less, you will get an alarm every five seconds as opposed to every five minutes until you clear or silence that alarm. Now I do encourage all of you to utilize the try it feature at the bottom of the alert profile. This will allow you to sample the alert, you know, make sure you like it and make sure you feel it's appropriate for you. Another thing to know about how the alerts work on the receiver is no matter what alert profile you pick, even if you pick an audible profile, the first alert you always get on the receiver is a vibration only. And if you miss that vibration and you did not press the center select button to clear it, then it would result in the audible alert five minutes later and it will keep repeating itself every five minutes until you press that center select button to clear or silence the alarm. Now you do have the option of using two different types of medical adhesive on your skin prior to placement of the sensor. The two brands that we can recommend to you are Mastosol and SkinPack. And if you choose to use these, you should apply them in what we call a donut fashion on your skin, meaning apply it in an oblong oval shape Leave the center of the oval exposed without any overlying medical glue. So that way when you place the sensor pod on top of it, you can line it up so that the needle will just puncture through your skin and not through any of that overlying medical glue. Also, you should let the mastosol or skin tack dry on your skin for about 30 seconds or so so that it becomes very sticky and tacky prior to placing the sensor pod on top of it. 
So now we're going to review the sensor applicator or the device you're going to use to apply the sensor to your skin every seven days. This diagram is color coded for teaching purposes, but in reality, your sensor applicator will be clear in color. And we're gonna spend some time discussing the different parts of the sensor applicator, so that way when I demonstrate for you how to perform the sensor insertion, it will make a little more sense. Now the first part I wanna point out to you is called the safety lock, labeled here in green. And the safety lock really serves really two purposes. The one purpose is it's there to prevent you from accidentally depressing down on the plunger before you should. But when you are ready to remove that safety lock, you should put it in a safe spot because you can use that safety lock in the future as a tool to help you remove the transmitter from the sensor pod at the end of the seven day sensor session. Now when you depress down on the plunger labeled here in turquoise with your thumb, that will insert the needle into your skin with the sensor wire inside of it. Now you obviously don't want a sharp, rigid needle sitting in your skin for the full seven days. So you will use the collar labeled here in yellow and you'll retract the collar or move that collar from the bottom of the applicator barrel to the very top of the applicator barrel. And that will remove the needle from your skin so that it just leaves a nice, thin, flexible sensor wire in your skin. Now you want to be very cognizant as to where you position your fingers in relation to that collar during the sensor insertion. You want to keep your fingers positioned above the collar when you depress down on the plunger with your thumb. That's very important because it's sort of contrary to your natural instinct. Your natural instinct is going to want to be to put your fingers below the collar when you press down on the plunger, but make sure you don't do that. Otherwise, you will retract the collar before you should, and that will remove the needle from your skin before it's been fully inserted and lead to a sensor failure. So make sure you position your fingers above the collar when you depress down on the plunger with your thumb, and then you can retract, put your fingers below the collar and retract the collar to the very top of the applicator barrel. Then you'll need to remove the applicator barrel from the sensor pod, and you can do that with the release tabs labeled here in Fuchsia. They feel like little ridged tabs, and there's one release tab on each side of the sensor pod. So you'll pinch those release tabs together, and then you'll be able to rock that applicator barrel out and away from the sensor pod so that it leaves just a very low profile sensor pod on your skin. You will then use the transmitter latch labeled there in purple to insert the transmitter into the sensor pod on your skin. Now you can place the sensor on the abdomen if you're an adult patient over the age of 18. If you're a pediatric patient under the age of 18, you have the option of not only placing it on your abdomen, but you could also place it on your upper buttocks as well. If you're on an insulin pump, make sure you place your sensor at least three inches away from your infusion set for your pump. If you're somebody that administers insulin injections, make sure you perform your insulin injections at least three inches away from your sensor site. But once you have found a good spot to place your sensor, make sure you thoroughly clean off your skin with a plain alcohol pad. And then you'll grab your sensor applicator, peel the two white pieces of paper off of the back of the adhesive, and place the sensor pod on your skin horizontally. Press down on the adhesive with your fingers. Press down pretty hard because the adhesive is pressure activated. So the harder you press down on that adhesive, the better it will stick. You will then need to remove the safety lock from the applicator barrel. So the safety lock is right here. So with one hand, just kind of grip onto the applicator barrel to secure it in place. Grab onto that safety lock and pull that safety lock out and away from the applicator barrel. And again, put that safety lock in a safe spot because you can use that safety lock in the future as a tool to help you remove the transmitter from the sensor pod. Now this is the collar piece. This is the piece where you, know, you want to be careful that you keep your fingers above that collar. So with one hand, you will pinch up on your skin in front of the sensor pod. Place your two fingers above the collar and your thumb on top of the plunger. Press down on the plunger with your thumb. That will insert the needle into your skin and you should hear two clicks when you do that. Then you can let go of your skin. You no longer have to pinch up on it, but continue to keep your thumb on top of the plunger and now move your two fingers below the collar and glide the collar to the very top of the applicator barrel until you hear two clicks. You then need to remove this applicator barrel from the sensor pod. So you'll locate the release tabs. There's a release tab on each side of the sensor pod. They feel like little ridge tabs. So you'll take your thumb and your index finger, 
feel for the release tabs. You can feel them better than you can see them. You will pinch those release tabs together and then rock the applicator barrel out and away from the sensor pod so that it just leaves the sensor pod and transmitter latch still attached to your skin. You then need to insert the transmitter into your sensor pod. So you'll take your G5 transmitter and you want to, in and you want to clean the very back of the transmitter with a plain alcohol pad. You want to insert the G5 end of your transmitter or the narrow end into your sensor pod first. So you're going to insert the G5 end of your transmitter into the sensor pod first on the side opposite of the transmitter latch. So if this is your sensor pod here and you've got your transmitter latch there, you're going to insert the G5 end in first on the side opposite of the latch. Let me show you another angle here. So you're going to insert the G5 end in first on the side opposite of the transmitter latch. Then you can lie that transmitter down just so it's resting right on top of the sensor pod. And it's not fully clicked in yet, so you just hold it in place with your fingers. And while you're holding it in place with your fingers, grab onto the transmitter latch, and you're going to pull the transmitter latch towards the transmitter until you hear two separate clicks. Now you have to pull pretty hard on that transmitter latch in order to hear those two clicks. You then want to remove this transmitter latch. So with a twisting motion at your wrist, you're going to twist, and that's going to break off the transmitter latch so that it just leaves a nice low profile sensor pod and transmitter on your skin. I really want to emphasize the importance of hearing those two clicks when you are pulling on that transmitter latch. It can be sort of shocking or surprising just how hard you have to pull on that transmitter latch to hear those two clicks. But if you were to only hear one click, if you didn't pull hard enough on that latch, only one side of the transmitter would get snapped into that sensor pod. So let me show you what that would look like. If you only heard one click, and if you were to look at the D for Dexcom end of your transmitter, what you would see is that one side of your transmitter is fully snapped down. This little gray triangular shape of the transmitter is fully seated below this clear plastic prong. But this side, this gray triangular piece of the transmitter, is sitting up just ever so slightly above this clear plastic wing. So if you see that, press down on the transmitter and that will fully snap that transmitter down into the sensor pod. Even if you think you heard two clicks when you were pulling on that transmitter latch, I recommend that you visually inspect the back of the transmitter to make sure that it's fully seated into that sensor pod. Great, so once you've inserted the sensor pod and transmitter onto your skin, check for the Bluetooth symbol in the upper left-hand corner of your G5 receiver home screen. That Bluetooth symbol will be flashing or blinking, indicating that your receiver and your transmitter are attempting to pair with one another. But 10 minutes after you have inserted the sensor pod and transmitter onto your skin, that Bluetooth symbol should stop flashing or blinking. It will become solid, indicating that your transmitter and your receiver have successfully paired with one another. So once they have successfully paired, you will want to start your sensor session on your receiver. To do that, just press the center select button on the receiver to access the main menu, select start sensor, and that will start your two hour warm up. Your two hour warm up is represented by a pie chart in the upper right hand corner of your G5 receiver home screen. As you progress through those two hours, you will not see any glucose readings on the screen and you will see that pie chart slowly start to fill up. At the completion of the two hour warm up, it will prompt you to perform your first two calibrations by displaying two orange blood drop symbols on the screen. Now what we mean by calibrate is you want to check a finger stick on your glucometer and manually enter it into your Dexcom system. So you'll check a finger stick on your glucometer, press the select button on the receiver to access the main menu, select enter BG, and then manually enter in your finger stick value. When you do that, that's considered a calibration, and you will want to repeat that process a second time, so you'll check another finger stick value, and then manually enter it into your receiver. And once you've performed those first two calibrations, your Dexcom will then display a glucose reading at the top of the screen. 
And you want to make sure that you continue to calibrate your Dexcom system once every 12 hours from there forward. And your Dexcom system will always alert you when you're due for a calibration. So on the receiver, when you're due for a calibration, you will see an orange blood drop symbol on the screen. When you see that, press the select button to clear the alert, press the select button to access the main menu, and then select enter BG to manually enter in that glucose value. Make sure you calibrate your Dexcom system once every 12 hours from there forward because that will maintain the accuracy on your Dexcom device. Now there are some helpful hints and tips we have for you regarding calibrations so that way you get good accurate readings on your Dexcom. One is that you should make sure you use a finger stick only to calibrate because the most accurate reading you can obtain from a glucometer is from the fingertip. Also, ideally wash your hands with soap and water prior to checking a finger stick that you plan on using for a calibration. You know, sometimes it's not sufficient enough just to simply clean your finger off with a plain alcohol pad prior to checking a finger stick that you're going to use for a calibration. Also, don't ever use any gel hand sanitizers to clean your hands prior to checking a finger stick that you're going to use for a calibration because that can also throw off the accuracy. Also, you can only calibrate with a blood sugar value between the range of 40 to 400. And you should never calibrate if you see any kind of error prompt on your Dexcom, such as three question marks. Now, the most common reason for three question marks would be if you did not get that transmitter fully snapped into that sensor pod. So if you ever see three question marks, check the back of the transmitter like I demonstrated earlier. And again, if you see that one side is sticking up, just snap it down with your fingers, and then question marks should resolve within about three hours. If they do not, you should notify technical support. Now this is the home screen of your G5 receiver. On your home screen is your trend graph, which is plotting your glucose as data points as you progress through your sensor session. In the upper left hand corner you have your battery symbol, which indicates the status of the charge on your receiver. Next to that you have your Bluetooth symbol, which we discussed earlier. And again, as long as that is solid, that means that your receiver and your transmitter have paired and they are successfully communicating. And again, they can successfully communicate so long as they remain within 20 feet of each other. Then at the top of your receiver, you have your current glucose reading along with your trend arrow. So your trend arrow is a very unique feature to a continuous glucose monitor. It tells you the speed and direction of your glucose, meaning is your glucose staying stable or is it rapidly rising or rapidly dropping? And this can help you proactively manage your diabetes, meaning you can really prevent a lot of the high glucose values and a lot of the low glucose values from even occurring in the first place. So for example, if you did see a glucose reading of 95 with two vertical arrows pointing straight down, this would mean that your glucose is rapidly dropping from a baseline of 95. And even though you're not low yet, you are likely to become hypoglycemic soon. And so you could take some kind of action, such as taking some food or glucose, to prevent that hypoglycemic episode from occurring in the first place. So now we're going to review how to set up the smart device. So if you are using a smart device, you will want to download the Dexcom G5 mobile app from the App Store. Once this is installed on your device and you open it for the very first time, it will ask you to log in with a username and a password. So if you have created an account with Dexcom in the past, use that same username and password to log in. If you have never created an account with Dexcom in the past, uh, there is an option there to click sign up and then you'll be able to sign in. But once you have successfully signed in, it will initially walk you through some precautionary statements, ask you to set your low and high alert, enter your transmitter serial number, and ask you if you would like to watch a video tutorial on how to perform a sensor insertion. At that point in time, you do want to make sure that you have inserted a sensor pod and transmitter onto your skin because your G5 app will attempt to pair to that transmitter on your skin. Now you must, in order for your display devices to pair to your transmitter, your transmitter must be snapped into a sensor pod and stuck to your skin. And it can take up to 30 minutes for your G5 app to pair to your transmitter, but once they have successfully paired, it will launch the two hour warm up, followed by the prompt to perform your first two calibrations. So you will check a finger stick on your glucometer, tap on the green circle that's displayed, and that will bring up a keyboard. There you can manually type in your glucose reading, select save and then save again, repeat that process a second time by checking another finger stick value, and then manually enter it into your G5 app. 
Once you've entered in those first two calibrations, your G5 app will then display a glucose reading on the screen. Now, similar to the receiver, the G5 app will also prompt you every time you are due for a calibration. You will receive an alert 12 hours from the last calibration that was entered. So when you are due for a calibration, you will see a red circle next to a glucometer icon on your G5 app home screen. So to enter in that calibration, you just simply tap on that glucometer icon. It will bring up your keyboard and you can manually type in your glucose reading from your glucometer to enter in that calibration. Now this is the home screen of the G5 app, and similar to the receiver, you have your trend graph, which is plotting your glucose as little data points as you progress through your sensor session. Above that, you have your current glucose value, and surrounding your current glucose value, or sort of encompassing it, is this trend arrow, you know, telling you the speed and direction of your glucose. In the upper left-hand corner of the G5 app home screen, you have these three dashed lines, which represent the main menu. Next to that is your glucometer icon, and again, that's what you click on when you want to enter in a calibration. Here we can see that this patient is not due for a calibration because there is no red circle next to that glucometer icon. Next to that is a icon of a person running, and that represents events. So you can enter in various types of events into your Dexcom system, such as how many grams of carbs you consumed, or how much insulin you administered, and all of that data will be recorded for you and your doctor to look back on at a later time. In the upper right-hand corner of the G5 app home screen, you have these, uh, or a little gray triangular symbol, and that represents Dexcom share. And we will be reviewing Dexcom share in a moment. Now this slide has a good description of the various trend arrows that you might see on your G5 app. And as you can see, the trend arrow on the G5 app looks quite a bit different than the trend arrows on the receiver. But in your quick start guide and your user guide, there is a good description of the various types of trend arrows that you might see and the degree to which your glucose is rising or falling. Now it's good for you to understand how the alerts will work on your smart device. So if your ringer is turned on, or the volume is set to greater than zero, or do not disturb is turned off, the first alert will occur at the volume at which you have your phone set to. If not cleared, it will result in an audible alert with increasing volume every five minutes until acknowledged. Now the newest version of the G5 app, version 1.5, does have the ability to override your phone settings. So if your ringer is off, or the volume is set to less than zero, or do not disturb is turned on, the first alert will be a vibration. And if not cleared, it will result in an audible alert with increasing volume every five minutes until acknowledged. The signal loss alert, however, is the only alert though that does not have the ability to override your phone settings. Now there is also a vibrate only option that you can select for a higher low glucose, low glucose alert or a rise or fall rate alert. This means that your phone would vibrate only regardless of your phone settings. But this vibrate only option is not available for the urgent low glucose alarm of 55 or some other critical system alerts. Also, the vibrate only option is only available on a cell phone. It's not available on other compatible smart devices, such as the iPod, for example. Now, your sensor is good on your skin for seven days. So, for example, if you insert a sensor on a Monday, you will be due to change out your sensor the following Monday. And your display device will provide you with warning prompts when your sensor session is about to end. You will receive warning prompts six hours prior, two hours prior, and 30 minutes prior to your sensor session ending. Once it officially ends, you will get a Replace Sensor Now prompt. This means that you will no longer see glucose readings on the screen and it's time to change out that sensor. Now it's good for you to know that you can end your sensor session early if needed by selecting stop sensor in the main menu. But if you get all the way to the point where it says replace sensor now, it has already ended your sensor session for you and you do not need to select stop sensor. Now once your sensor session has officially ended, you will need to remove the sensor from your skin. To do that, you will simply peel that sensor pod off your skin like a band-aid with the transmitter still attached. And then you will need to remove that transmitter from the sensor pod either using the safety lock or your fingers. 
You can then discard that old sensor pod, but hang on to that transmitter because you need to use it with your subsequent sensor insertions. Make sure you do not throw away your transmitter because it is good for three months. And you may have received either one or possibly even two G5 transmitters. Make sure you only use one G5 transmitter at a time, meaning use one G5 transmitter for the full three month battery life, then discard it and then start using your next G5 transmitter. Now there are some tips we have for you if you are planning on using both your receiver and the G5 app at the same exact time. One is that you only have to calibrate one device. Also, you only have to start and stop a sensor session on one device. However, when you get an alert, such as an alert for a high or a low sugar, you will get the alert on both devices and you will have to clear or acknowledge the alert on both devices separately. Now, both your receiver and your G5 app have an urgent low glucose alarm of 55 milligrams per deciliter. This alarm cannot be turned off. It cannot be modified in any way. It's just a very good inherent safety feature. So that way you're always alerted in case you're having a severe, potentially even life-threatening hypoglycemic episode. Now you can use your Dexcom G5 to make treatment decisions, such as treating for a low, dosing for a high, or when determining how much insulin to take prior to a meal. However, you must have both a glucose reading and a trend arrow displayed on the screen to make treatment decisions based on the Dexcom glucose value. You absolutely must have those two pieces of information displayed to dose off of your Dexcom. So whether you're new to Dexcom or an experienced user, you should continue to use your glucometer for treatment decisions until you understand how the Dexcom works for you. It could take days, weeks, or even months for you to gain confidence in using your CGM for treatment decisions. In the beginning, you should compare your Dexcom value to your glucometer value to see how the accuracy may vary depending on the situation. For example, compare the two numbers in different situations, such as after a meal or after exercise or on day one of the sensor session versus day seven of the sensor session. And once you understand how the Dexcom works for you and you have confidence in its ability to track your glucose appropriately, then you can consider making treatment decisions based on your Dexcom glucose value. Now, even though you can use your Dexcom G5 to make treatment decisions, there are still certain scenarios that will require the use of your glucometer. For example, you will need to check a glucose re reading on your glucometer to calibrate your Dexcom system. Also, you will need to use your glucometer for treatment decisions if you do not see both a glucose reading and trend arrow displayed on your screen. Also, you should never make treatment decisions on the Dexcom glucose reading if you have acetaminophen active in your body. Acetaminophen, otherwise known as Tylenol, can create falsely high readings on your device. So if you absolutely have to take, take that medication, you know, check with your healthcare provider to see how long acetaminophen stays active in your body for. And keep in mind, there are quite a few medications out there that do contain acetaminophen, you know, things like Vicodin, Norco, or even some over-the-counter cold medications. Also, you should verify your glucose reading on your glucometer if you ever experience symptoms that are not consistent with the Dexcom glucose reading. For example, if you were to experience symptoms of hypoglycemia, such as shaking or sweating, and your Dexcom was providing you with a glucose reading within a normal range, you should verify your glucose reading on your glucometer. We always say, whenever in doubt, get your meter out. And because your Dexcom is measuring your glucose continuously, you are now going to be constantly aware of when your glucose is high. And this can sometimes lead to people overcorrecting for a hyperglycemic episode by taking two doses of rapid acting insulin in close succession. And this is called insulin stacking and it can lead to severe hypoglycemia. So you should check with your healthcare provider to see how long your rapid acting insulin stays active in your body and how far apart you should be spacing your doses of insulin. So when determining how to make treatment decisions using your Dexcom, you should speak to your healthcare provider. Some people might even consider taking a little more or a little less insulin, depending on the trend arrow information displayed. However, you should check with your healthcare provider to see if you should do that, and if so, just how much more or how much less insulin you should take, depending on the trend arrow information displayed. 
And one of the last things we're going to discuss today is Dexcom Share. It's really exciting technology because it allows the patient to share their glucose information in real time with up to five loved ones or family members called followers. This means that the followers can view the sharer's glucose information at any moment in time and be alerted when the glucose is too high or too low. So to set up Share, you can click on the triangular icon in the upper right hand corner of the G5 app home screen. It will ask you to provide it with your follower's email address because it is going to send your follower an email invite that will expire within seven days. Your follower will need to open that email on their smart device, download the follow app and accept that email invite or accept the invitation. Share is only available on a smart device because both the sharer and the follower need an active internet connection in order for Share to function properly. Now lastly, if you are planning on traveling with your Dexcom system through an airport, be careful that you do not expose any component of your Dexcom system to an x-ray machine or a body scanner, otherwise known as an AIT or millimeter wave scanner. It is okay for your Dexcom device to pass through a metal detector. However, if you did not want to pass through a metal detector, you can ask the TSA to perform a full body pat down with visual inspection of the device. You can also bring your quick start guide with you and reference section 10, which explains that this is a medical device that cannot be removed and it describes some of the precautions listed here. Your Dexcom G5 device is safe for use on commercial airlines, so you can keep your receiver turned on both during takeoff and while in flight. And if you're using the smart device, and if you turn your smart device to airplane mode, make sure you return to the settings option on your smart device and turn Bluetooth back on. That will allow your smart device to continue to communicate with your transmitter so that you can continue to get glucose readings and alerts on your G5 app while you're on an airplane. Great, so that completes our webinar for today. Please review the indication for use and safety statement in your quick start guide and in your user guide. And I'm part of the patient care department. We are a group of certified diabetes educators and other healthcare professionals available to answer your questions and provide you with ongoing support. So if you did need to reach us, you can dial 1-877-339-2664 and follow the prompts for training and education. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We would be happy to help you. And we look forward to supporting you. Thank you for joining our webinar.